Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India, India's voice to the world. This is News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. Namaskar. Coming up in the next hour. India's External Affairs Minister assures that India will become a permanent member of the UNSC. Says that the world feels that the UN is becoming weak and is unable to solve global issues. India's digital economy is growing at a rapid pace, records 57% rise in volume, posts a record 44% rise in value. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu regrets the killing of aid workers in Gaza, describes the incident as tragic and unintended. Russian President Vladimir Putin orders an investigation into the concert hall attack near Moscow and says that the attackers had links to Ukraine. Well, the United States and Britain have announced a new partnership on the science of artificial intelligence safety. This is amid growing concerns about next generation versions of AI getting smarter. This MOU was signed in Washington and is to jointly develop advanced AI model testing. And it follows uh, commitments uh, announced at the AI Summit uh, on Safety, which happened in Bletchley Park in November of last year. However, What's happening uh, in the recent past on AI, uh, the misuse concerns and regulation? Let's take a look at this report to find out. Elections in democratic countries can be hit by misinformation provided by AI tools such as deep fakes. While many of these are easily recognizable as fakes, the impact they could have on the impressionable mind could take on catastrophic proportions. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, while interacting with Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates recently, raised concerns regarding the misuse of artificial intelligence if placed in unskilled hands. Look, AI has the challenges that I have seen. I have seen that it is so good thing. If it is properly trained without someone's hands, then it is more likely to be misused. Ho ne ki अब मैंने एआई से जुड़े सारे ब्रेन से उनसे भी बात की मैंने कहा शुरू में हमने कोई भी एआई जनरेटेड चीज है उस पर आना चाहिए वाटर मार्क ये एआई जनरेटेड है ताकि कोई मिसगाइड ना हो और ये बुरी चीज नहीं है सिंपली इट्स एआई जनरेटेड एंड जस्ट डेज आफ्टर इंडियन पीएम रेज कंसर्न्स ओवर एआई मिसयूज United States and Britain on Monday announced a new partnership on the science of artificial intelligence safety. This comes amid growing concerns about next generation versions. US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo had recently commented about how US multinational firms were looking to diversify supply chains and were ready to supercharge investments into the Indo-Pacific. Britain and the US are among countries establishing government-led AI safety institutes. Last month, British Deputy PM Dowden had hoped that democratic countries would come together to protect democracy from AI influencing elections. And this compact is about those democratic nations coming together to recognize that threat, particularly in the, the AI space. This is not about the, the internal politics of, of each individual uh, nation state. So that's rightly a, a, a matter for nation states. Generative AI, which can create text, photos and videos in response to open-ended prompts, has spurred excitement as well as fears it could make some jobs obsolete, append elections and potentially overpower humans. The U.S. is essentially concerned about the threat of AI applied to bioterrorism or a nuclear war simulation. On the 21st of March, the world spoke in one voice calling for safe AI systems for sustainable development. It is clear 
every nation is on the lookout to fashion this amazing tool for public good. Uh, today, all 193 members of the United Nations General Assembly have spoken in one voice and together chosen to govern artificial intelligence rather than let it govern us. The groundbreaking resolution adopted today cements global consensus for safe, secure, trustworthy AI systems, systems that both advance sustainable development and respect fundamental freedoms. Just as an aside, here's a look at what AI can do to entertainment industry. China Media Group recently launched a selection of micro-drama series entirely generated by artificial intelligence. AI handled every aspect from art design, storyboards, video production and voice dubbing to soundtrack. The production also broke down language barriers thanks to AI-assisted translations. Bureau Report, DD India. UPI transactions have crossed 130 billion mark in the recent financial year, uh, signifying a massive 57% increase in volume and a 44% jump in value. This surge positions India as a potential leader in the global digital economy, potentially becoming the world's third largest economy. Here's the report. In a first unified payment interface, UPI transactions in India in the financial year 2023-24 posted a record 57% rise in volume. UPI transactions also posted a record 44% in value. March 2024 transactions saw 55% rise in volume to 13.44 billion. The transactions also saw 40% rise to over $250 million in March 2024. For the first time, UPI transactions closed at 131 billion. In the last two years, numerous nations have begun to acknowledge payments via UPI. Several countries including Nepal, Sri Lanka, Mauritius, Malaysia, France, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Singapore, Maldives, Bhutan and Oman have facilitated UPI-based payments. On the other hand, Immediate payment service transactions in March 2024 posted a 17% growth in volume to over 581 million transactions and 16% growth in value to over 70 billion US dollars in volume in March 2024. Earlier on Monday, India's GST collection for March 2024 came in at over 22 billion dollars. GST collection sees 11.5% year-on-year growth. GST collection from domestic transactions at 17.6%. GST collections for March 2024 up with 18.4% growth compared to March 2023. In a new report, India is expected to become the third largest economy by 2027 and the market cap will hit 10 trillion US dollars by 2030. Currently, India's market cap is the fifth largest globally with 4.5 trillion dollars. The US, China, Japan and Hong Kong are at present ahead in India in the market cap race. India's external affairs minister, the senior BJP leader, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, on a two-day visit to the state of Gujarat in India, reaffirmed uh, India's UNSC bid. He said that India is definitely going to get it. And the next report uh, by DD India correspondent Meghna Dev tells us how. BJP leader and Rajya Sabha member was on a two-day visit to Indian state of Gujarat. During his visit to Rajkot, Dr. S.J. Shankar affirmed India's UNSC bid saying that India will definitely get it. When will we permanent membership? Kab milegi? <clears throat> Jarur milegi. Jarur milegi. Par kuch bhi जो बड़ी चीज होती ना बिना मेहनत के कभी मिलती नहीं तो मेहनत भी करना पड़ेगा अभी दुनिया में यह फीलिंग है कि यूएन बहुत कमजोर हो चुका है कि यूएन की कहीं चलती नहीं है यूक्रेन अब यूक्रेन युद्ध में यूएन में डेडलॉक दे, हो गया था अभी जो इजराइल गाजा में जो चल रहा है वहां भी यूएन की सहमति नहीं बनी इसमें तो मुझे लगता है कि जैसे यह फीलिंग बढ़ता जाएगा हमारे लिए 
जो सीट मिलने की संभावना जो है वो भी बढ़ती डॉक्टर एस जयशंकर इंटरक्टेड विद मीडिया इन अहमदाबाद ऑन ट्यूजडे ऑन द रेड सी इशू रेड सी में दो चीजें हो रही है एक के कुछ ताकतें शिपिंग को ड्रोन और मिसाइल के थ्रू अटैक कर रही और दूसरा की जो सोमालिया में जो पायरेट्स जो है वो जहाजों को टेक ओवर कर रहे हैं क्योंकि उनको लगता है कि ये उनके लिए एक अवसर बन गया है बाकी नजर दुनिया की नजर वो मिसाइल और ड्रोन पर है तो उनके लिए एक कहीं यह अपॉर्चुनिटी है तो अब हमारी जो चिंता है ये दो किस्म की चिंता है एक कि इतना व्यापार हमारा रेड सी उस वेस्टर्न अरेबियन सी के थ्रू जाता है सुज कैनल होते जाता है तो वो चिंता का विषय है Speaking on Beijing naming Indian territories of Arunachal Pradesh Dr S J Shankar said that India has rightly called it a senseless attempt and Arunachal Pradesh was is and will always be Indian We rightly called it senseless by doing it repeatedly it is still senseless So I want to be very clear Arunachal Pradesh was Arunachal Pradesh is Arunachal Pradesh will always be Indian and I hope I am saying it so clearly that not only in the country but beyond the country also people get that message very very clear Dr Jay Shankar's two day visit to Gujarat covered the region of South Gujarat Saurashtra and Central Gujarat where he visited Surat Rajkot and the city of Ahmedabad he also met young leaders businessmen entrepreneurs and media persons and answered questions pertinent to Gujarat as well where he answered questions like the ban on the import of russian diamonds by the EU and G7 countries which has impacted the diamond polishing industry in Gujarat specifically in the city of surat he also answered questions related to the red sea issue which has impacted the shipping industry with camera person kunal this is megna day for dd india from ahmedabad gujarat well india has slammed china for renaming places in the northeastern state of arunachal pradesh the external affairs ministry said in a statement and i quote china has persisted with its senseless attempts to rename places in the indian state of arunachal pradesh We firmly reject such attempts assigning invented names will not alter the reality that Arunachal Pradesh is has been and will always be an integral and inalienable part of India on court India's minister for earth sciences and the member of parliament from Arunachal Pradesh Kiran Rijiju took to X and he said this India has the sovereign right to develop its border area and every Indian has an absolute right to visit every part of the country's territory minister rajuju wrote that prime minister narendra modi has changed the congress's policy of keeping the nation's border underdeveloped and made the border villages the first villages of the country to modi ji ne aakar ki ye congress ka niti ko palat karke ab sare border area mein रास्ते बन रहे हैं वहाँ पे बेसिक सुविधा 4G नेटवर्क पहुँच रहे हैं स्कूल वहाँ मेडिकल फैसिलिटीज़ गांव में पीने का पानी बिजली सब पहुँच रहे हैं तो ये काम बहुत तेज़ी से चल रही है इसलिए चीन बहुत ही घबराया हुआ है खफा है भड़के हुए हैं तो इसलिए वो जो नामकरण हो रहा है तो नामकरण करने से क्या कोई बदल जाएगा क्या मेरा जगह है मेरा ज़मीन है मेरा पहाड़ है उसमें चीन कैसे आकर के नाम रखेगा कोई फ़र्क नहीं पड़ता Well, still to come here on DD India News Hour, a glimpse of the parties and leaders on campaign for the first phase of the Great Indian Election. Spotlight on the aftermath of the recent Israeli air strike in Gaza. And North Korea's latest intermediate-range ballistic missile launch ratchets up. tensions As a cycle of accountability returns the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history development justice regionalism 
a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024. The battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. Let's now get you the latest from the world's largest democratic election, the Indian general election. As election fever grips India, political parties are intensifying their campaign for the grand general elections of 2024. The Bharatiya Janata Party is canvassing and uh, it's canvassing its works during its tenure. And the opposition parties are also coming uh, up with poll promises in a bid to uh, get a larger share of the votes or, you know, to gain some ground. Let's take a look at Dibyendu Mondal, uh, his report on the day's activities. On Tuesday, Prime Minister Narendra Modi campaigned for the BJP in Uttarakhand's Rudrapur, part of the Nainital Udham Singh Nagar constituency, and Rajasthan's Kotputli, part of the Jaipur rural constituency. Modi ji ko Jai Shri Ram. Both these constituencies are going to polls in the first phase on 19th of April. The Prime Minister, during his rally on Tuesday in Uttarakhand's Rudrapur, attacked the opposition leader Rahul Gandhi for his comment that targeted the BJP. Congress or Indi Gadbandan ne apne irade dikha diye hai. Congress ke shahi parivar ke sahajade ne. Sahajade ne alan kiya hai. कि अगर देश ने तीसरी बार बीजेपी सरकार को चुनी आग लग जाएगी 60 साल तक देश पर राज करने वाले 10 साल सत्ता से बाहर क्या रह गए अब देश में आग लगाने की बात कर रहे हैं क्या यह आग लगाने की बात आपको मंजूर है क्या इस देश को आग लगाने देंगे While BJP's senior leader and union home minister Amit Shah also campaigned for the BJP throughout on Tuesday in the southern state of Karnataka Shah apart from addressing and meeting the BJP workers in Bengaluru he also held a road show in the state as part of the party's campaign in Karnataka the state is going to polls in two phases on the 26th of April and the 7th of May. The Opposition Congress on Tuesday released a list of 17 candidates for the Lok Sabha elections. These candidates are from the states including Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, Bihar and Bengal. Apart from this, the Congress also released the list of candidates for the Assembly elections of Orissa. The largest opposition party, the Indian National Congress, is also likely to release its election manifesto later this week. While the former president of the party, Rahul Gandhi, will file his nomination from the Wayanad constituency in the southern state of Kerala. As the nomination for the second phase have begun, several candidates from different political parties have started filing their nominations, while BJP candidate and actor-turned-politician Arun Govil filed his nomination today from the Meerut constituency in Uttar Pradesh. Congress's former Chief Minister of Chhattisgarh, Bhupesh Baghel, filed his nomination from the Raj Nandangao constituency in the state. With the onset of April, the political parties of India have less than three weeks to woo voters and expand their influence before the election kickstarts on the 19th of this month. Dibyendu Mondal's report for DD India. Managing uh, logistics in a country with uh, 968 million voters is an incredible task and it will be carried out by the Election Commission of India when the country holds the general elections. This next report tells us 
more about the ECI's roles and uh, also its powers. After India became independent in 1947, the founding fathers of the Indian Republic envisaged a representative parliamentary democracy based on the universal adult franchise. Keeping in line with those ethos, the Election Commission of India was established on 25th of January 1950. The ECI is an autonomous constitutional body responsible for conducting and regulating polls. Its powers are broadly divided into three categories – administrative, advisory and judicial. The administrative powers include registration of eligible voters, Preparation of poll schedule depending on the availability of resources both in terms of execution and security needs. Scrutinize nomination papers of candidates. The poll body's most important task is to ensure the fairness of the electoral process and prevent incidents of rigging, booth capturing and violence. Coming to advisory powers. The ECI can recommend the President and the State Governors to disqualify sitting members of Parliament and members of Legislative Assemblies respectively if they are found guilty of indulging in corrupt practices during polls. As for the judicial pass, the Election Commission cannot review any poll result on its own. This can only be done through an election petition which can be filed before the High Court. But the ECI can settle disputes related to recognition of political parties. Apart from ensuring free and fair elections, the poll body has also been organizing various awareness campaigns to increase voter turnout. Bureau Report, DD India. Well, with the upcoming Lok Sabha elections and legislative elections, uh, the same Election Commission of India has issued guidelines for media coverage. The guidelines prohibit the media from displaying election-related content via cinematograph, television or similar means during 48 hours before the polls close. The media must ensure content during this period does not favour any party or candidate. Political advertisements in media within any polling area during the same 48-hour period uh, are prohibited. In the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict, Israel has announced an independent investigation following an airstrike in Gaza that killed seven aid workers uh, from the uh, NGO World Central Kitchen. Meanwhile, tensions have surged between Iran and Israel after an attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. While the Palestinian Prime Minister Mustafa has uh, vowed to alleviate Gaza's sufferings after his first cabinet meeting. Amid the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict, a significant spotlight has turned to the recent attack on aid workers intensifying concerns about the safety of humanitarian efforts in conflict zones. At least seven employees of the NGO World Central Kitchen, including foreigners, were killed in an airstrike on Gaza, reportedly late on Monday. The Israeli military said on Tuesday that an independent group will investigate the tragic death of Gaza aid workers. We have been reviewing the incident in the highest levels to understand the circumstances of what happened and how it happened. We will be opening a probe to examine this serious incident further. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Tuesday lamented the killing of aid workers and described the incident as tragic and unintended. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic case of our forces unintentionally hitting innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in wartime. We are thoroughly looking into it, are in contact with the governments and will do everything to ensure it does not happen again. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also said Washington has urged Israel to carry out a swift, thorough and impartial investigation into the Israeli airstrike. Uh, we've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident, we've urged a swift, 
a thorough and impartial investigation to understand exactly what happened. On the other hand, tensions between Iran and Israel have escalated dramatically following a brazen strike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus on Monday, with Tehran vowing swift retaliation against its longtime adversary. The attack killed seven people, including three senior Iranian commanders. Meanwhile, Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammad Mustafa, after convening his first cabinet meeting on Tuesday, said the government is making efforts to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza. From the first moment of its formation, the government has made efforts and international contacts around the clock to alleviate the suffering of our people in Gaza Strip, starting with urgent needs for humanitarian relief and ending with reconstruction. As the international community remains vigilant in its efforts to address the root causes of the conflict and support those affected by its devastating consequences, Prime Minister of United Kingdom Rishi Sunak also urged Israel to conduct a thorough investigation into the circumstances surrounding the airstrike on aid workers. With bureau inputs, Rabindra Chauhan's report for DD India. Now shifting our focus to the Korean Peninsula, where a missile test by North Korea has increased regional tensions, with South Korea suspecting the use of solid fuel engine in the launch. Let's look at this report. North Korea's latest ballistic missile launch has once again put the Korean Peninsula on the edge amid concerns that Pyongyang was testing new weapons powered by a solid fuel engine. Our military immediately detected, tracked and monitored the North Korean missile upon launch, closely sharing relevant information with the US and Japan. It is being assessed that this is related to solid fuel ground test that North Korea publicly reported in March. The move was condemned by South Korea, Japan and the US. While the US called the launch destabilizing, South Korean President Un suk Yeol accused Pyongyang of trying to create confusion in his country ahead of a parliamentary election this month. Japanese Prime Minister Fumo Kishida also slammed North Korea, saying that it was damaging regional peace. We strongly disapprove of this act because it has implications to not just the security of our nation but of the region and the international community. Let's also take a look at how the solid fuel technology can boost missile systems. Solid fuel missiles do not need to be fueled immediately ahead of launch. They require less logistical support, making them harder to detect. Notably, they are more durable than liquid fuel weapons. The launch happened as South Korea imposed sanctions on two Russian vessels, saying that they transported arms between North Korea and Russia. The US and its allies have accused North Korea of providing weapons to Russia in its conflict with Ukraine. Both Moscow and Pyongyang deny the allegations. Bureau report, TD India. Well, let's take a look at uh, news uh, coming in from around the world. At least 27 people were killed in a fire that broke out at an entertainment center during a renovation in Istanbul on Tuesday. Seven of the eight people injured were in critical condition. Fire health and police teams were dispatched to the scene. The cause of the fire has not been determined. Senegal's Basiro Doemaye Faye took oath as the West African nation's president on Tuesday. Faye is Senegal's fifth and youngest president ever. Faye promised to restore stability and to bring economic progress during the oath-taking ceremony held in Senegal's capital, Dakar. Britain's uh, Thames water has recorded alarming levels of E. coli bacteria in its water, according to official data. And uh, Britain's uh, biggest water utility said that its shareholders had refused to pay $631 million promised to stabilize its finances, heightening concerns over its survival. Belgium is seeking UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage status for its rod puppetry and 1,680 square meter flower carpet 
rolled out every second year in front of its capital, Brussels City Hall. Let's take a look at uh, these uh, Belgian traditions, in fact, as we saw there. Still to come here on DD India News R. Advantages and disadvantages of AI regulation and how to get the best out of it. A school shooting in Finland kills a child and injures two others. And summer heat sets in. Some places in East India have crossed 40 degrees Celsius. Guest Kai? India that invents. India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. Watch India Ideas each Thursday, 8 p.m. only on DD India. Mark Lynn, let's uh, give you a recap of the main stories. India's external affairs minister assures that India will become a permanent member of the UNSC and says that the world feels that the UN is becoming weak and is unable to resolve global issues. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu regrets the killing of aid workers in Gaza and describes the incident as tragic and unintended. The Russian President Putin orders an investigation into the concert hall attack in Moscow and says that the attackers had links to Ukraine. And in a short while from now, we'll be going back to our top story, in fact, uh, the story about artificial intelligence and how it should be regulated or whether it should be regulated, its advantages and disadvantages. We shall be joined uh, by a member of the National Security Advisory Board, Mr. Anshuman Tripathi. He'll be joining us in a short while from now. And uh, we'll be discussing with him about, uh, you know, AI security regulation, uh, the good and bad, basically, of uh, the artificial intelligence project and how as it advances it gains uh, strength and perhaps uh, you know humans need to catch up or stay aware or be wary of uh, its advances so it's an interesting subject and uh, a lot of the world leaders have been uh, bringing it up the issues of deep fake communications in ai how they can influence uh, the minds of people and uh, other issues uh, the good of AI also, how it can bring an importance in the, in the area of precision uh, and also in logistics and things like that. Mr. Anshuman Tripathi is now with us, member of the National Advisory Board. Uh, he's with us in the studio. Thank you very much, Mr. Tripathi. Uh, so we know that uh, the UNGA last month, in fact, on the 21st, had passed a resolution regarding AI, whether they're all wanting to regulate it. But uh, when we look at regulation, are we looking at, you know, some overarching big rules for the whole world that everyone should follow? Is that the best way forward? Or to build sort of alliances and say that, okay, let's go step by step. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, essentially, uh, the United Nations is looking at an overarching body as a base or a foundation to start with. Because India is lucky and blessed to have a lot of software talent mm -hmm. and a good AI base. Not every country is as uh, well blessed. So we do not want to leave out biases in the data sets of other countries. We do not want other vulnerabilities to be there. Therefore, a basic framework is of a lot of use. Indeed, and uh, you know, when we look at AI, we know about, we, we talk loosely about machine learning 
And we know that when a machine learns, it improves, it doesn't repeat its mistakes. Also technology improves because uh, the processing speed improves of the machine. So it's a matter of if or when, uh, I mean that's the question, uh, whether it is going to be beyond us to control it. I guess uh, it's if we allow it to. Okay. If we allow it to take control, it would. And I'd give a simple example of even today with WhatsApp, mm -hmm. we have autocorrect. Many times we give out sentences which are incorrect and then we either correct them or let them go if the correction is very small. Mm -hmm. So in a similar context, if we allow the AI to take control, we lose control. Else we can always keep control as humans. Okay. Uh Let's look at some of the advantages then that come straight to mind. Uh, the biggest concern of the planet currently is climate change. And we can see that AI tools can help, uh, you know, churn out some sort of the best solutions for conservation, also for efficient energy use. What do you think? Absolutely. Essentially, AI works on data sets. The larger the data set, the better it is. So in case of climate, we have large sets of data with a lot of countries, including our own, and therefore we can utilize AI to give us a lot of advantage in climate change, climate prediction, in uh, pollution check, and so on and so forth. It's a good um, area for AI to have applications, and I'm sure there'll be startups in India and abroad which shall be looking at that challenge. Uh, also, in the area of, uh, you know, theoretical physics, uh, maths, uh, uh, AI can probably test the theories faster, may help us to expand on general relativity and, you know, things like getting us closer to understanding black holes, gravity and the like. What do you think? Interesting question, because, as I said, AI works on data sets. The larger the data set, the better it is. So in those cases where we have labs which have done experiments and have data sets, AI will be uh, utilized. But AI also has research ongoing on smaller data sets. So in the near future, I'm sure there will be new areas where AI will find application in uh, theoretical physics. But okay. right now, the larger models are the way to go. Okay. Uh, also, AI helps us, uh, you know, in creating more order, we know that in the world, uh, precision across sectors. I mean, we're using it in transport and logistics, aviation, supply chain management, you name it. You know, uh, this kind of efficiency is likely also to render humans less productive. How do you view this? Uh, as a problem or as a, as a solution? <laughs> this is a... <laughs> age-old question since the uh, 19th century when the ludets were around and uh, the original uh, you know uh, textile machines came about and uh, people felt that they'll go out of jobs let me assure you time and again we've come to this problem and we've all been better at solving them we'll have new technologies we'll have new applications which will create new jobs there'll be new databases new data sets which shall be created there'll be a lot of opportunities is just that we choose the right efficiencies to get more efficient than to get lazy. So would that require, you know, uh, the human being to uh, equip himself or herself, try and uh, develop skill sets that can match this new uh, industry 4.0 order of uh, things? Or is that uh, just going to happen as a natural course? I mean, we presume that youngsters are already into technology. Uh, is that really the truth or do we have to develop that? We are in the process of developing that and a lot of it has already been developed. As the Honorable Prime Minister spoke about it in his recent speeches also, mm -hmm. we are reskilling and upskilling and the recent uh, India AI mission which has been launched this month, there's 10,000 crores which have been put in place for doing that activity in eight different sectors in the uh, AI uh, technology base. So there's a lot of effort and a lot of technologies are being developed, a lot of startups are working in that area and I think India is going to be one of the key players in the world in AI. So we used to have a problem uh, of hackers in the, back in the day, uh, you know, when the internet was getting uh, more and more popular. So can AI be trained in a sense, it's also using data sets and probably abilities uh, to uh, beat the best security protocols that are in place. So we know that, uh, you know, uh, uh, chess software is better than the best grandmasters already. So I mean, taking that as an example. 
this is a standard cat and mouse game that has continued for a long time. The Tom and Jerry of uh, national securities. Mm. I think going forward, there'll be new tools, new hackers will come in, apply AI, and then there'll be new anti-hacking um, mm. technologies which will also apply the same AI. So there'll be drones and anti-drone solutions. There'll be new uh, hacking solutions and new anti-hacking solutions. And as the Honorable Prime Minister said, we shall utilize new technologies, but also for things like deep fakes and all, mm -hmm. we are looking at getting a watermark in place so that the general public is aware of where their vulnerabilities are and what is true and what is AI generated. So this is a, okay. a, a game which shall continue. So uh, finally, I mean, how do we make use of AI to make humans more productive uh, with their time and energies? Because what could happen is that, you know, if AI is doing everything, the human being uh, tends to have a lot of time on his hand and uh, starts probably wasting away. The idle mind has many other op opportunities. Uh, so, I mean, to try and make use of the best of both. Well, that's a human choice. Okay. Uh, well, we have all kinds of transport. It is our choice whether we walk, have a daily morning walk or not. If we don't, we lose out on our own health. So it's a mature choice, it's a prudent thing that we use technology to augment our capabilities instead of becoming more and more lazy. Though it's a normal human failing that we tend to use uh, technology, AI or any other technology, to make ourselves lazier and make the technology do what we did. But as the Honorable Prime Minister said, let's challenge ourselves and use AI only in those places where we are already very, very well, uh, you know, placed. So we augment our capabilities and go f further and many steps ahead. Uh, also, I mean, with uh, taking this question a little further, if, you know, I mean, we watch all these uh, famous old movies of spies and things like that, James Bond and the companies, uh, they come across these so-called villains who are uh, capable of utilizing whatever is available uh, to bring destruction to the world. Uh, now that uh, this, this technology is available, I mean, it's available and we can see that it is growing. I mean, it's not really science fiction anymore. Uh, is there that fear? Uh, that fear? That fear surely exists. And that is why security frameworks are being developed worldwide. We saw the US-UK framework come out. Mm. India has also developed frameworks with the United States in the uh, initiative of critical and emerging technologies. So those frameworks are being put in place just to nip that bud of technology going in the wrong hands and unskilled people using those technologies. And I'm quite sure we are in a good position with that. Uh, Mr. Tripathi, thank you very much uh, for spending your time with us and enlightening us on this interesting subject. Thank you so much, sir. Now, the Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Russia will investigate last month's uh, attack on a concert hall near Moscow that killed at least 144 people. Russia says it has evidence that the attackers had links to Ukraine, even though Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack. Now you together with your colleagues from other agencies take part in investigation of the deadly terrorist attack on March 22nd. As I said earlier, it is important for us not only establish the direct perpetrators, but also all the links and chains of ultimate criminal beneficiaries of the atrocity. We will get them without any doubt. Well, in the latest from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu on Tuesday, he said that uh, its forces had captured five settlements. Four of them were in Donetsk, one in Zaporizhia, and uh, the last one, uh, it, in fact, this all happened last month. Uh, in February, Russia had claimed its first uh, significant territorial advance in nine months with the capture of the strategic city of Avdivkwa. Shoigu also stated that the Russian troops had continued to push back the Ukrainian formations towards the west. Despite the lack of results on front line, Kiev is still trying to persuade its western sponsors that it is capable to resist the Russian army. 
to this effect it is attempting to shift the combat operations to the territory of our country using acts of terror and shelling of the civil population in finland a shooting incident inside a school has killed one child and left uh, two other children seriously injured on tuesday the police have cordoned off the the school building and a 12 year old suspect has been held the finnish prime minister petteri orpo has expressed deep shock over the incident and said that his thoughts were with the victims and their families and dd india's john beaver reports from brussels Pupils at the school in the city of Vanta, north of the capital Helsinki, had just returned to their classrooms after the long Easter holiday weekend. The victims were all 12 years old and believed to be classmates of the suspect. He was arrested a short time after the shooting, having fled the scene. Local police have said that he was holding a gun when he was stopped, but was arrested in a calm manner. They say he admitted to carrying out the shooting when initially questioned, and it's believed he used a gun that was licensed to a relative. The Prime Minister of Finland said the incident was deeply shocking and sent his condolences to those affected by the shooting. Finland is known as a country of hunting and gun enthusiasts. It has one of the highest number of firearms per resident in the world with 1.5 million guns in a population of 5.5 million people. Gun ownership laws though have been tightened relatively recently after two deadly school shootings in 2007 and 2008. In those incidents a total of 18 people were killed and the law was changed so that you have to be 18 years old to own your own weapon. The police say an investigation into murder and attempted murder is now taking place. The suspect is being held by social services as children under the age of 15 are not criminally liable in Finland. John Beaver in Brussels reporting for DD India. Well, let's take a look at other stories now making the news in India. The Food Safety and Standards Authority of India has asked all e-commerce food business operators to ensure appropriate categorization of food products being sold on their websites. This corrective action aims to enhance transparency regarding the nature and functional properties of the products ensuring that consumers can make well-informed choices without encountering misleading information. The Election Commission of India on Tuesday launched Myth versus Reality microsite to combat fake news. The page consists of busted fakes, myth versus reality explainers, FAQs and other reference material. As the country gears up for the upcoming general elections, Northern India, uh, the world famous ski resort Gulmarg has hosted a mega voter awareness campaign on Tuesday. The program was organized under the election commission's systematic voter education and electoral participation program called sweep and heat wave has gripped uh, eastern india in the state of odisha on tuesday at least eight places recorded temperatures above 40 degrees celsius it's just the beginning of april um, india's met department has forecast a heat wave Uh, likely at isolated pockets of the Gangetic West Bengal and Odisha uh, from the 3rd to the 6th of April. And still to come here on DD India News Hour. The star England all-rounder Ben Stokes makes himself unavailable for the T20 World Cup. England are the defending champions. India's Sumit Nagal breaks into the top 100 in the ATP rankings. Inter Milan continues a seemingly unstoppable march to the Serie A title. As the cycle of accountability returns, the time has come. when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history development justice regionalism a big political canvas everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory dd india dissects what makes elections 2024 
the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian Election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. And now let's get you all the news from the world of sports. And let's begin with uh, the news about uh, Ben Stokes. It's a shocking development for Team England ahead of the T20 Cricket World Cup. Ben Stokes has confirmed that he does not wish to be considered for the England team selection for the summer ICC Men's T20 World Cup, what would one would consider like the most important tournament in current times. Uh, now, Stokes says that uh, his primary focus is to get fully fit to bowl not only for the summer of test cricket, which includes two three-match test series against West Indies and Sri Lanka, but for, the, for all forms of cricket in the future. He said in a statement, and I quote, I'm working hard on, and focusing on building my bowling fitness back up to the, uh, fulfill a full role as an all-rounder in all formats of cricket. I wish uh, Joss, he means Joss Butler, of course, uh, Motti, and that's the white ball coach, Matthew Mott, and all the team, the best of luck in defending the title, on court. The Kolkata Knight Riders uh, versus uh, Rajasthan Royals match at the Eden Gardens on the 17th of April has uh, advanced by a day. Gujarat Titans clash with uh, Gujarat Cap uh, with the Delhi Capitals, I beg your pardon, at the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad will now be played on the 17th of April. The match was earlier scheduled on the 16th. The BCS, BCCI had earlier announced that the IPL schedule in the two phases, uh, but initially the board had unveiled the itinerary for the first 21 matches before releasing the timetable for the remaining 53 fixtures following the announcement of the general election schedule in India so that they don't clash. Now, ace uh, Indian tennis player Sumit Nagal on uh, Monday achieved a career high ranking of 95 in the ATP singles chart after impressive results in recent times. His previous best was 97 in February, which he had attained after winning the Chennai Open, an ATP Challenger Series event. Nagal made headlines in January after he made it to the main draw of the Australian Open and also became the first Indian to beat a seeded player, Alexander Bublik of Kazakhstan, in the same uh, game, in the same tournament before bowing out uh, in the second round after losing to Shang Zhucheng of China. Now, after his Chennai Open triumph, he also played two more challenger tournaments along with the ATP 500 competition, the Dubai Championship, and a couple of ATP 1000 Masters tournaments, Indian Wells and Miami. But his best performance at uh, this time was, re was restricted to the semi-final finish in the Bengaluru Challenger, but it's good that he's in the top 100. Football now, the runaway leader Inter Milan has continued its seemingly unstoppable march uh, to the Serie A title after an early goal from Federico Di Marco and a late effort from Alexis Sanchez secured a 2-0 win at home against Empoli on Monday. Inter is top of the table with 79 points, 14 ahead of City rivals AC Milan in second place with eight matches left to play. Empoli is 18th with 25 points. The result pushed Empoli into the relegation zone level on points with uh, Frosty Nunn in uh, 17th and one point ahead of the 19th placed Sassalo. 13 years ago on this day, the 2nd of April 2011, India etched their names in World Cup folklore because uh, after a 28-year wait, MS Dhoni's men had lifted the coveted World Cup trophy at the Vankade Stadium in Mumbai, culminating a tournament that will forever be remembered by Indian fans. It's the anniversary of one of India's great cricket wins, cricket moments, and we take a look once again at that historic moment. Dhoni finishes off in style. A magnificent strike into the crowd. India lift the World Cup. After 28 years, the parties start in the dressing room, and it's a, an Indian captain who's been absolutely magnificent in the night of the final. 
MS Dhoni will collect the World Cup trophy. Well, it was a great six. It was not quite the helicopter shot that one uh, had expected of Dhoni. Very clean six uh, on the onside over mid on. That's all we have in this edition of DD India News Hour. But uh, let's know your thoughts on the news of the day. Connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. But we'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Mark Lynn. And from all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour. Namaskar. <laughs>